John Henry Cole is captain. Boss man, do you ever pray? Well, if I miss this deal, let this hammer get away. Mara be your barren day. Lord, Lord. Let Mara be your barren day. John Henry. This is En Masse, bringing together stories of struggle and hope from the working class. I'm your host, Liz Medina. This is the first season of En Masse, titled Bedrock. The bedrock is what we stand on, holding us up wherever we are. It is always shifting and moving, yet it holds us steady day after day. It is ever-present, yet we usually have to dig down to see it. In Barrie, Vermont, the bedrock is both a physical reality and a metaphor. Barry's bedrock was formed between the Silurian and Devorian periods, hundreds of millions of years ago. In certain places, igneous rocks formed from liquid lava have broken up through this old bedrock, creating unique deposits of granite. Barry is part of the bedrock on which I live. I arrived here almost five years ago. The neat towns nestled among mountains appeared as if they arose as naturally as the bedrock on which they were built. I ended up here because I had endured over six months of unemployment. And, like the many ways of immigrants who came here before me, this place seemed like my best shot at life. I don't live in the town of Barrie. First, I lived in Montpelier, three other out-of-staters and I, all of us in our 20s and in Vermont for AmeriCorps jobs, found a small four-bedroom apartment to share through Craigslist. Then I found a job doing clerical work at Goddard College, a small liberal arts college in Plainfield, and so I moved there. Barrie, however, is about 10 minutes away from both of these towns. And while every place has its stories, it was Barrie, more than Montpelier and Plainfield, that spoke to me. Let me introduce you to Barrie. Barrie is located in central Vermont and has a current population of about 9,000. It's a small town, but not a very small town like some others in Vermont. In fact, the median population of a town in Vermont is about 1,200. Up and down Barrie's main street, there's the standard small town offerings alongside a collection of old stores that have withstood the test of time. There's a gas station every few blocks, a Dollar General, a couple convenience stores, a mechanic shop, car parts stores, hardware stores, a diner and a couple other restaurants, a shop for shoe repairs, and a shop for sewing services. Then there are some things one doesn't find in every small town in America. There is a cooperative artist studio and gallery, and most notably, some of the finest and largest granite deposits in the world. The town of Barrie struck me as both ordinary and extraordinary. I learned that Barrie was the granite center of the world back in the early 20th century. Upon further research, I also learned that Barrie was a place of radical vision and action. They had once elected two socialist mayors, Robert Gordon and Fred W. Souter. Militant workers inspired by the traditions of socialism and anarchism led the town and even the entire nation in their fight for social progress in the form of the eight-hour day and workers' rights. Mother Jones even came to Barrie to organize retail clerks, most of whom were women, presaging what would much later become the new front of the labor movement that is, the service sector and all of the women and people of color who work in it. All this and so much more surged forth in Barrie, brilliant, strong, and extraordinary, like the granite on which it sits. Today, this history is overshadowed by poverty and a sense of loss. Some refer to the town as Scary Barrie, reflecting a history of decline that is familiar to anyone who has ever lived in a deindustrialized or Rust Belt Town. It is familiar to me as someone who grew up in New York's Rust Belt. 
The histories of Rust Belt towns go something like this. Industry comes to a sleepy farm town and transforms it into a boom town, buzzing with economic activity. Then, decades later, industry leaves in search of greater profits, carrying off all the wealth the workers created and abandoning the community. In spite of its unique and radical legacy, Barrie is no exception to this patterned history of exploitation and deindustrialization. Twinges of despair and nostalgia register with every empty building and fragment of broken glass. I know the feeling well. I tried to run away from it. I left my home in central New York, but it followed me here in central Vermont. It can feel like an inescapable ending. It can feel like there is nothing more to do or say. But instead, I dug deeper. I delved into Barry's history and all of the life histories it holds. I found hidden transcripts of resistance everywhere. These transcripts didn't exist on the surface. They had to be carefully excavated layer by layer, starting with the history of a place, then its people, and finally, all the struggles that change the course of those histories. Over 200 years ago, downtown Barrie was much smaller. The town had only 1,700 people, according to the 1810 census. The people living there were mostly farming families. Then, shortly after the War of 1812, quarrying rose as an industry. In the beginning, quarrying was very labor-intensive, which constrained its growth. There weren't any power tools or railroads to make the job any easier. Only so many orders could be handled, and the buyers had to be relatively nearby. But massive projects were nonetheless undertaken during this time, such as the construction of Vermont's capital in Montpelier. But aside from these major projects, the industry mainly produced millstones and architectural embellishments for the homes of the wealthy. When the Vermont Central Railway extended its line from Mount Pelier to Barrie in 1875, the granite industry grew exponentially, and so did Barrie's population. By 1888, there were rail connections that went directly into the stone quarries. Granite products could now be easily shipped out of state, and the market for Barrie's granite was blown wide open. More labor was needed to satisfy the growing demand. Waves of immigrants from Europe came to work in the granite industry. And in 1890, Barry's population more than tripled, growing from 2,060 people to 6,812. By 1910, the population had almost doubled to 12,852. The first wave of immigrants were English and French. The second wave were Irish and Scottish. The Irish in particular came in large numbers due to the potato famine of the 1840s. The third wave of immigrants were Finns, French Canadians, Italians, Norwegians, Swedes, Swiss, and Arabs, who were generally referred to as Syrians at the time. The third wave was catalyzed by the great demand for labor in producing Civil War gravestones. Then there was a fourth wave of Germans, Spaniards, Poles, Russians, and other Eastern Europeans, and more Italians. The fourth wave arrived between 1920 and 1950, and they were largely escaping war and persecution. Immigrant men in Barrie found work in the booming granite industry. Stone carving or sculpting was the most highly paid and arguably the most highly skilled job in the industry. Many of the Italians who immigrated to Barrie had worked as carvers in their home country, they held the majority of these jobs. Skilled jobs, but not highly skilled, consisted of stone polishers, sawers of rough stone, tool sharpeners, and, starting in the 1920s, sandblasters. Sandblasters, I learned, create designs by blasting sand over a stencil on a stone. Then, there were all of the semi-skilled and unskilled jobs. Many of these were jobs down in the quarries. To give a few examples, there were the lumpers, who chained stones to then be moved out of the quarry by the derrick operator. 
Then there were the people who set the dynamite to break away large chunks of stone in the quarry. And, of course, all of the odd jobs that needed to be done around the quarries, sheds, and manufacturing plants, such as boxing the stones for shipment, cleaning up shops, etc. All of these jobs, again, were performed by men until the mid-20th century. Immigrant women, on the other hand, were confined to performing largely domestic duties, whether within their own household or outside of it. In addition to doing most or all of the labor in raising a family and managing a home, many of them earned money by running boarding houses, making and serving food and drink, working as retail clerks, and connecting calls as phone operators, to name the most common occupations outside the home. Their lives and their jobs were dependent on granite workers' wages, whether directly through their husbands or indirectly through workers and their families purchasing their services. Then, not long after they emigrated, Barry's granite industry violently contracted during the Great Depression. It would never again produce as many jobs as there were before the Depression. Smaller granite quarries couldn't compete and were either abandoned or purchased by larger ones. Essentially, the Great Depression led to monopolization. While the number of granite manufacturers remained steady for a while, the number of quarrying companies the companies that actually extracted the granite from the earth, declined. In 1914, there were 14 quarrying companies and 75 granite manufacturers employing 3,100 workers. In 1943, there were only five quarrying companies, and the number of workers decreased by over a third. Eventually, the granite manufacturers consolidated too. In 1950, there were 60 granite manufacturing firms. Today, there are just over two dozen. In terms of workers in the industry, the Times Argus, a local newspaper for the Barry montpelier area, reported a decrease in the granite industry from around 1,000 workers in the 1990s to about 550 today. Monopolization doesn't just mean higher prices. It also means fewer jobs. When companies merge, the first thing they usually do is lay off a bunch of workers. In October 2010, Swenson Granite announced its acquisition of Rock of Ages. In 2016, Polycore Incorporated announced its acquisition of Rock of Ages and Swenson Granite. Today, Polycore is the largest producer of marble and granite in North America. And in turn, Polycore has been acquired by TorQuest Partners, one of the largest venture capital firms in Canada. TorQuest owns seven companies, including Polycore. Worldwide, the biggest exporters of granite today are from developing countries like Brazil, India, and China. Some of these exporters employ slave and bonded labor. Regardless of the worker's status, the working conditions in these countries are harsh and dangerous. This part of Barry's history is not unique. I want to take a moment to underscore the degree of monopoly power in our country today. According to a 2017 article in the business section of The Atlantic, just two corporations make 69% of the beer we drink, just five banks control about 47% of the nation's 17 trillion in banking assets, just four airlines dominate the skies, Walmart alone captures 50% or more of grocery spending in 40 metro areas. And perhaps one of the most directly felt forms of monopolization, 75% of households have at most only one internet provider from which to choose. But monopolization isn't the only cause of job loss. While harder to measure, automation also plays a major role. Even though Barry's granite industry only employs about 550 people today, its productivity is higher than it's ever been according to the Granite Museum's executive director, Scott McLaughlin. All of the advanced machinery introduced over the years has allowed workers to produce more at a faster pace. As early as the 1870s, water turbines and steam engines were powering sawing and polishing machines. In the 1890s, air compressors and the pneumatic tools they powered made carving easier and faster. In the 1920s, sandblasting was introduced in Barrie 
which eliminated the need for highly skilled carvers on certain jobs. Today, CNC machines can take a rough piece of stone and do all the fine carving and sculpting on its own. And, like the phenomenon of monopolization, automation has been happening all over and with far-reaching effects. Various studies have speculated that automation will affect anywhere from 14 to 54 percent of jobs. A commonly cited study by Oxford University estimates that 47 percent of U.S. workers have a high probability of seeing their jobs automated over the next 20 years. The forces of monopolization, automation, and of course outsourcing, send shockwaves that erode towns like Barrie. But this is a narrative of abstract forces. What about the people? How do they live with and against these forces of change? What have they done before, and what do they do now? In searching for these answers, I found a collection of oral histories from the Great Depression. The Federal Writers Project, as part of FDR's New Deal, paid unemployed writers to talk to workers in Barrie. All kinds of workers, even artists like themselves. I read all the edited transcripts they produced that I could find. The life stories were fascinating and complex, different yet resonant with the struggles and hopes of today. I wanted more, but I found none. Between the Great Depression and the present, there is a lacuna in the archives, a great fault line between now and then. In times of economic and government austerity, we are both materially and culturally deprived. Our country would never again invest in our society to the scale of the New Deal. Our histories and memories have been lost like grains of sand slipping through an hourglass. There's something else in those oral histories, something that felt fundamentally necessary to record. It was an understanding of struggle and power, but not only that, it was an understanding from the working class, our perspective, our words, an understanding that consoles and mobilizes us generation after generation. From the very beginning, oral history has been a way to document the people's history. Winston Churchill once said, history is written by the victors. He was right. The ruling class and the wealthy control the resources, including all forms of knowledge production. But we, the working class, outnumber them. And each one of our stories has the potential to subvert their history and ideology. In 2017, I decided to continue the work of the Federal Writers Project in Barrie. Using a tiny recorder and scraps of free time, I recorded the oral histories of those who lived or worked in Barrie. But I decided to take it a step further. I decided to use the stories I recorded to amass even more stories. Then I would create a podcast, this podcast, to continue the process of transforming individual consciousness into ideally class consciousness. And so I found more people across Vermont to perform a selection of oral histories from both the past and the present from both the Federal Writers Project and my own project, and then relate their own thoughts and stories. Barry has a tradition of class consciousness and resistance. In spite of the many challenges they faced, workers in Barry dreamed of better worlds. They practiced it through sharing their stories, their struggles and hopes, which brought them together en masse. Then they got organized, which gave them the power to win better pay, better working conditions, a better life. A better life not only for themselves, but for all workers. I can already feel the ground shifting, even here in central Vermont. The working class is the bedrock of history. Listening is part of the process of change. It is the beginning of an analysis of mapping the totality of the terrain in which we live. And, like any map, we start from where we are. Our first episode features the oral history of Sarah Miller, which I recorded in 2017. Sarah is a diversion case manager. She has witnessed the struggles of people dragged down in Barry's economic decline firsthand. But she is not a passive witness. She walks with them.
Thank you for listening. We have additional reading materials, archive footage, and show notes on our website. While there, you can give us feedback or suggestions for the next season. This is an independently produced show. I receive support from you, my listeners. If you like this show, go to onmasspodcast.com slash donate to show your support. The song, John Henry, at the beginning of our show is from the Alan Lomax Collection at the American Folklife Center, Library of Congress, used courtesy of the Association for Cultural Equity. I'm Liz Medina. This is On Mass, bringing you stories of struggle and hope from the working class. John Henry told his captain, going on down the track. Captain, captain, oh Lord, I may not never come back. Oh Lord, I may not never come back.